Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have today with us Matthew Ellis, uh, who is the director of the Breast Cancer Research Program at Washington University in St. Louis. And they have been pioneers in a variety of different areas uh, that we are going to cover today. One of them, which is an area that uh, Dr. Ellis brought over to WashU, is his interest in looking at hormonal therapy, but more specifically, looking at preoperative hormonal therapy as a model to understand which drugs work better, but also the biology uh, behind uh, the response to hormonal therapy. Can you comment on uh, those studies, uh, in particular, some of the data that you're going to be presenting at this meeting? So for those who don't know much about this area, postmenopausal women with hormone receptor positive breast cancer, particularly those who also are um, HER2 negative, their major uh, therapy is with various types of endocrine treatment, and this would include tamoxifen and particularly aromatase inhibitors to reduce the relapse rate. The problem with these drugs, of course, is they don't work uniformly. They work well in some patients and not so well in, the, in others. We began to study these drugs uh, in the preoperative setting. That is to say, taking a patient who had a larger breast cancer who needed downstaging uh, in order to have a better surgical outcome. So a typical patient might be someone who the surgeon said, you need a mastectomy. Or I could try a lumpectomy, but I'm not sure I'll be successful. And so we took those patients and instead of doing the traditional thing of giving them chemotherapy, we started a program of giving them an aromatase inhibitor before surgery. Now the patient benefits here actually turn out to be quite striking with very good responses in many patients leading to a dramatic increase in the breast conservation rate. So the first thing to say is patients get a lot out of this therapy. So to give you some statistics, for example, in the study we're showing tomorrow, of patients told at baseline they definitely needed a mastectomy. After four months of therapy with an aromatase inhibitor, only half of them had a mastectomy. The second major benefit of giving neoadjuvant endocrine therapy is that it's very rich information with respect to whether the tumor is going to respond in the long term to aromatase inhibitors. Because remember, a patient is going to receive an aromatase inhibitor for at least five years, and uh, we all know that that period seems to be getting longer and longer. So really all you're doing is shifting that surgical date just a few months into a very long period of therapy to find out if a patient's really going to be a, a, a long-term survivor because they're responding to the endocrine therapy or whether there's something unpleasant about that tumor that makes it resistant. And uh, so that has two implications as it turns out. The first implication is for personalization of therapy. We've uh, been able to come up with an index called the Preoperative Endocrine Prognostic Index. Patients who have tumors that respond beautifully to the aromatase inhibitor, when the tumor is taken out after four months and there is no growing cells in the tumor at all, what's called the Key 67 proliferation index, is completely suppressed. The tumor is small and no negative. Actually, in those uh, those, uh, the, the, the studies we've done, almost no patient relapses under that circumstance. Whereas larger tumors, which perhaps responded less well, or if there's lots of proliferating cells at four months, those are the patients who tend to relapse. So first of all, that's another piece of useful information that you could use, say, to decide on who would need chemotherapy or not, right, after neoadjuvant endocrine therapy. And then the third thing, Sort of another implication is if you had two endocrine drugs and you wanted to compare them. Traditionally, what we've done is done huge studies, right, to compare, let's say, tamoxifen with an aromatase inhibitor. The average sample size for those trials is in the five to eight thousand range. The ATAC trial was nine thousand patients, right? What if there was a way of judging whether those two drugs were likely to be equivalent or likely to be different. Well, it turns out looking at the proliferation index after just a short period of therapy with these drugs in the preoperative setting is really very predictive of the long-term success of those trials. This was first seen when we compared the letrozole and tamoxifen in the neoadjuvant setting, looked at the proliferation index, found that letrozole suppressed growth of the ER-positive tumor 
better than tamoxifen. And subsequently, we know that the big trial, the big, it actually is called the big trial, <laughs> it's big and it's called big, big 198 trial, uh, showed a positive advantage for giving letrozole. This result was again seen in the studies done by Mitch Dowsett in London with the IMPACT trial. And then very nicely, tomorrow we have two trials up side by side. We have a trial comparing two aromatase inhibitors, exemestane versus anastrozole. And we have the neoadjuvant equivalent of that, randomizing patients between anastrozole and exemestane um, in, in, you know, before therapy, looking at those key 67 changes. So it turns out that anastrozole and exemestane are as near as you could say identical drugs in terms of suppression of relapse free survival. And that sample size was almost 8,000 patients. Same randomization, less than 200 patients. Looking at the proliferation index, two drugs are equivalent. So you could work out with 2% of the sample size and just four months of therapy whether those two drugs were different. And if you've known that, probably you'd never have done the MA27 or uh, exemestane and astrozole comparison. So I think my view of this field at this point is if you were a cardiologist, let's say, and you had two drugs and you were interested in reducing stroke risk, and those two drugs reduced blood pressure by exactly the same amount, you would never do a large trial seeing if those two drugs had a chance of showing a difference in suppression of stroke rate. So you've got a good surrogate, it's called blood pressure reduction. Well, we have now, I think, the validated equivalent of, for that for endocrine therapy for breast cancer. I'm going to flat out say tomorrow, we should never do another large adjuvant endocrine therapy trial comparing two drugs until they're supported later in the neoadjuvant setting. Well, so that's a, a wonderful platform, really, to accelerate clinical research. Are there other aspects of um, uh, correlative sciences that you can garner from this information, and I'll use this opportunity as a platform to talk about one of the new emerging technologies that is now being applied to understand tumor biology, and this is full genome or near full genome sequencing, or as it's called, next gen or deep sequencing. Can you tell us a little bit about that technology? And you've obviously been a leader in the field of showing what that means in terms of true uh, human biology and, and human right. tumors. What, what can we expect out of this technology? Well, recently we published a paper uh, where um, we uh, studied one patient. Because, of course, the human genome is three billion base pairs, and it's a lot of work to resequence that patient's genome and the matched tumor sample. But when I went to my colleague in the genome center at WashU, I said, and they could, after they sort of come to me and said, choose a patient for us to sequence, I said, well, I would like to actually take this one patient, but I'd like to sequence four genomes because they were expecting to say a normal tumor pair. I said, well, I've got this particular patient. She's African-American. Uh, she was diagnosed with a rapidly a progressive uh, basal-like breast cancer, and I have a sample of that at diagnosis. And then, sadly, she progressed in her brain. And I have a sample of that tumor as well because she had surgery on her brain. I have her germline. And interestingly, I have her primary tumor growing in a mouse so now I have four germs, four germ, uh, uh, genomes, the xenograft from the primary, the brain there, the primary in her germline. So we sequenced the whole thing. It was uh, half a trillion base pairs of sequence. What did we find? Lots of mutations. And if you look at the, what we call the allele frequencies of these mutations, how many times do you see a particular mutation in a population, they range from 2% to 100%. So what that says is there's a lot of clonal diversity in the tumor. You've not really got one cancer. Because if it was one cancer, the mutations would only occur at 50% frequency or at 100% frequency, because you've got two chromosomes, two copies of every gene. It's either mutant or it's not. It doesn't look like that at all. It's very chaotic. Lots of different clones in the tumor. So the question is, which clones spread to the brain? And the answer is it's very clearly a subclone. And what was growing in the brain was more homogeneous from a, from, a, from a clonality point of view, clearly a subset of cells had broken off to form the brain map. And it was probably a rare subset, because one of the mutations was only present in the primary at a 2% frequency, but it was a frequent mutation in the brain map. And the xenograft 
even though it had been derived from the primary, looked much more similar to the metastasis. So the xenografting process pulled out this nasty clone of cells that was killing the patient, which made the xenograft actually a very interesting model. What are we doing with this now? Well, I think we're going to have to get used to the idea that breast cancer, we're used to talking about breast cancer as being different one patient to another. But I think we're beginning to understand within one patient, there is a huge amount of clonal diversity, which of course explains a lot about breast cancer, how it escapes therapy, how it can shrink, but cells are left behind. Those cells are left behind have a different mutational repertoire. They're different uh, genomically. Uh, they're coded for resistance. They may have existed at diagnosis, but maybe you couldn't see them so well because there was another more dominant clone that had to be treatment sensitive. Now you're dealing with this resistant clone. And so I think that probably to really get at the crux of the problem, we're going to have to do a lot more work on not sequencing tumors just at the beginning of the diagnosis, but in a longitudinal way, particularly, let's say, my area of neoadjuvant endocrine therapy well, we've sequenced lots of ER-positive uh, uh, tumors at this point. But now what we're doing is looking at those tumors again after four months of aromatase inhibitor therapy to see what clones actually can survive the absence of estrogen. Because after all, that's what's going to kill the patient. And those clones actually may be relatively uncommon in the primary and hard to see. But now you can see them because the lowering of the hormone level got rid of all the sensitive clones, and now you can see the tumor that you really need to be treating with next generation drugs. So I think that next gen sequencing is going to be a revolution in the, how we think about cancer, how we treat cancer, and a revolution in diagnostics. And I don't think it's going to take that long before we'll see this, this, this approach in clinic, because the, sequ the rapidity with which we can sequence DNA now is unbelievably fast. Uh, it's, essentially become very much like development of uh, um, cell phones or something, a big clunky thing, and you end up with this thing you watch a movie on. You know, it's a similar kind of thing. Um, and I think that um, we'll, uh, we'll be thinking about breast cancer very differently in five years from now uh, with respect to how we think, it, think about it now. Well, thank you, Matt, for, for those insights. It is amazing how the field has progressed from the Human Genome Project less than 10 years ago being completed to, to, to full genome sequencing. Yes, yeah, so it took about a 10 years to get yeah. the first human genome, and it takes us about a day uh, to get a whole genome now at, this, uh, at a big genome center. Well, thank you for being with us, and uh, thank you for your attention.